for first of all, thanks everybody for joining. Uh, thanks for tuning in uh, here on Zoom for another uh, special Love Your Neighbor Sunday community partner conversation. Um, hey, if, uh, if you're new to our community, uh, maybe perhaps checking us out for the first time. Uh, thanks so much for being here. Honored that you choose to uh, share space with us and spend your Sunday morning with us. Uh, one of the things that we do every fourth Sunday uh, is what we call Love Your Neighbor Sunday. Uh, and the whole kind of concept, uh, the premise of it is instead of going to church, we actually get to be the church. Uh, we are intentional about going out into our respective neighborhoods and communities uh, to, to love our neighbor and to work together for the common good. Um, that being said, one of the things that we've been acknowledging uh, as a community as we find ourselves still uh, a year later in this pandemic um, is that, that in a lot of ways, I think that the ways in which uh, many of us have perhaps been accustomed to kind of going out and loving and serving our neighbors uh, in our communities uh, just look a little bit different in a pandemic. Uh, things that perhaps we used to do, uh, we're not able to do. I, I know a lot of us uh, were kind of, we've had the opportunity to privilege and, uh, of partnering with a lot of different community organizations. And obviously, even just a lot of those opportunities um, have had to kind of be put on hold, uh, given everything that's been happening around us. And so, uh, you know, one of the things that we've been talking about as a church, as a community, is rather than seeing this as an obstacle, um, that I think instead it's an opportunity for us to perhaps see this as an invitation, uh, an opportunity where God might be inviting us and challenging us to um, expand our understanding and our imagination of what it means to uh, to love our neighbor and to work for the common good. Uh, and so one of the things that we've really been doing is just taking a posture of learning uh, on Love Your Neighbor Sunday. Uh, and we've been able to host some really, really just amazing conversations with uh, different organizations, uh, different individuals uh, who are loving and serving their communities in very real and tangible ways. And so Today, I just want to jump right in. We are super, super excited, uh, thrilled uh, to introduce our special guest this morning, uh, the Reverend Jason Davidson. And uh, by the way, quick shout out uh, before I introduce Jason, a quick shout out to Simon Okello. I think Simon's on here. Simon uh, made the connection for us. And um, so we're just really, really honored uh, to be able to have this and to share space together. Uh, Jason, welcome to the Common Good fam. Uh, thanks so much. I, I know you, your schedule is crazy. You literally jumped off of teaching the class right over at your church. Right. I, yeah, I don't came right here. So uh, I guess one of the benefits of technology is you didn't have to drive 20 minutes to get here. I you know. know. I know. <laughs> Just switch over the Zoom and we're good. Right. You know, I'm a little tired of Zoom, but that is a blessing to be able to, <laughs> to be able to do that. So thank you so much for having me, Pastor Royce. I'm truly blessed and, and humbled to be invited and and to get to know you, uh, friends. And uh, thank you, Simon. Uh, yeah, I think he's on here. Um, so yeah, blessed to be here. Absolutely. Well, we're super, super excited just to be able to, to have this conversation, really, uh, around uh, what does it look like to, to love our neighbor? Uh, what does it look like to love our neighbor well, even in the midst of a pandemic? And um, yeah, I'm just excited for you to be able to share some of your story, some of your journey with us and for us to kind of learn from you as well. So um, anyways, common good fam, maybe I know it's like weird. You can't like clap your hands, say hi, maybe do a virtual, virtual hi. Uh, let Jason know that uh, you are so, that you're grateful that he's uh, here with us. Oh, I love it. All the hand claps and the thumbs up. Oh, yes. I love it. I feel it. I feel it. <laughs> awesome. Um, well, you know, maybe by, by way of uh, just kind of introduction, um, you know, when I think about someone that has been uh, just incredibly intentional about uh, building relationships and investing in the communities that, that they've been a part of, uh, you're clearly someone that, that has embodied that. Uh, you've done it in a number of just different ways from uh, being a public school teacher uh, in the Seattle School District to church planting and owning and operating a cafe in the Central District. Uh, I think you spent a couple of years actually working for the Union Gospel mis Mission uh, as a church uh, engagement uh, in their kind of church engagement space. Uh, and, and now you're pastoring a, a church uh, in Capitol Hill. And I don't recall the exact title, but I, a lot of what you're overseeing is kind of what we're going to be talking about today. Right. Uh, the neighborhood, community development, community partnership. And so, yeah, maybe just by way of introduction uh, to let kind of folks know who you are. Uh, maybe you could just share, uh, just talk about some of the things that you've done, a lot of the number of different hats that you've done. And 
I, I might certainly even be missing a few things. And no, no, it's kind of one or two things that like really, really was kind of meaningful for you. I'm sure each of those were unique and different in different ways. But um, just thought maybe you could just kick us off by by talking about some of that. Sure. Yeah. And um, you know, I think for me, um, I, I I wonder if maybe we could have a brief word of prayer and also just, I just want to say it, say as preface, like, I guess the underlying commonality and what I um, have done or been a part of is just coming in as a learner and a, and a participant. And I, I think you, from what I know of common good, you guys have done that pastor Royce, even before you guys reached out to me, I, I remember seeing something that common good was up to around repentance and racial justice and reconciliation last year I, I read something about i think it was in the seattle times and uh, they were interviewing you and i was just like i am so impressed with common good with pastor royce so i'm not coming in as this guru i'm coming in as a learner and a participant and that's been a theme throughout my roles and also what encourages me to share the space with you today so i'm i'm humbled by you all as well and thankful royce for your leadership so um could, could i could i open with some prayer? Or? Absolutely. Absolutely. We'd, we'd be honored with that. Lord, uh, thank you for this time. Thank you for Pastor Royce. Thank you for Simon. Thank you for everyone here on this call and who's not able to be on this call this morning with Common uh, coming, uh, Good. And just thank you for all the, the work you're doing in this congregation, in this community, and everything that's going on on the east side with a collection of churches and, and organizations that uh, Common Good gets, gets to be a part of. Bless our time today, and may it be a time of, of sharing and listening and questioning and, and just uh, just sharpening as iron sharpens iron. So we thank you for this time. Holy Spirit, be with us and empower us for this moment in time. In Christ's name, amen. amen. Yeah, I would just say, you know, I, um, I my sense, I, I have worn a lot of hats since the late 90s. Uh, just working as a mentor and a tutor and then moving into being a school teacher in Seattle Public Schools to, I left for a while to seminary in St. Louis and, and um, got a master's in divinity and worked on kind of an emphasis on urban ministry and church planting. Um, and then my wife and I uh, came back out here to, to Seattle uh, with our two kids. Now we have three but with our two kids and said, hey, we want to, we do want to plant a church, but we also want to just be listeners and participants in the community. Um, I think a big part of, of my theological vision, my just vision uh, has just always been to see places, not just as places of need, but places, places of assets and, and strengths and beauty. So Seattle, sometimes, particularly in evangelical circles or Christian circles, uh, we see it as this dark place that's unchurched. I don't know if you guys have heard that, or it, there's, it's just so progressive that it's, there's, no, there's no place of, of light. And I think that that can really cause us to uh, really focus on tribalism and not see that there are places that there's a lot of commonality and shared burden. And I think what I try to do is also to see, yes, there are places that are that are dark and that need to be redeemed, but there are also places that God, through common grace and through the beauty and through the Imago Dei, the image of God, has has blessed people who whom you would you would not maybe ordinarily want to partner with uh, to be um, conduits of His grace and of His truth. So I spent a lot of time prior to church planning working in contexts that were anti-Christian or post-Christian, as you may have heard those terms before, where people are, have left the church because they grew up in a Catholic context or in African-American tradition, or in, they were in white churches and felt like, man, I just, I, I feel like my race wasn't seen in, in the church or my sexuality wasn't really welcomed. Um, my politics weren't welcomed or my status as a newly, you know, um, uh, as an immigrant weren't, weren't welcome as I am new to this country. So I ended up working with a lot of people who weren't Christians, but really were doing things in the community advocate wise that 
I admired and loved and thought that Jesus would stand behind. So I spent a lot of time working in activist circles and nonprofit circles where people I would find actually had a long history in the church, but it left the church. Um, and uh, from that, I did a lot of work as a business owner and then moved into church planting. And then our church plant closed because I was trying to plant in a in a neighborhood that had a lot of gentrification and a lot of cultural friction in it in the central district. And uh, I'll be short. And then, you know, after that church plant closed, I went and worked for the Seattle's Union Gospel Mission, where I would work with largely conservative churches uh, on the east side and in the Capitol Hill um, central district neighborhood. And I'd work with progressive churches and work with Seattle University. So a wide variety of churches. And during that time was, you know, the Pulse shooting. What was that? I think that was 2017, the Pulse shooting. Uh, Philandro Castile. There was a series of shootings that year. And so it just touched off a lot of conversation between churches across the city around race and justice. Um, and, uh, and then from that, moving to Grace Church Seattle as an associate pastor, where I'm doing a lot of the same work of reconciliation and, and empowerment. So, yeah, I've had a lot of hats, but I think part of it has just been coming in as a learner and as a, a participant yeah. in, in God's work that he's doing in the church and what God is doing in the city of Seattle. Yeah, that's awesome. Pastor Jason, thank you so much for sharing that. I think it's such a beautiful vision for really what it looks like to 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 kind of partner and to to love our neighbor well right and uh, i think it, it's a good segue into i kind of wanted to maybe just start set the conversation in the tone this is called love your neighbor sunday and um you know i know so much of what you do right is kind of grounded and rooted in jesus's command right to to love god with all your heart mind soul and strength and to love your neighbor as yourself um, you know, that being said, I know that oftentimes within Christian circles, within the church, even outside of the church, right, that term kind of gets thrown around a lot, right. uh, love your neighbor. And so I thought it'd be awesome if you could maybe just um, share a little bit of like, what what is kind of your understanding of uh, what it means to, to love neighbor? Um, yeah. And even, you know, are there kind of certain scriptures, stories, uh, narratives within uh, the Bible that kind of that you go to when you think about kind of how you understand and how you define and then ultimately kind of how you, you decide to kind of live this out. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I wonder if I did a pop quiz, would we all say similar uh, scriptures? Because I think I think we all kind of have similar scriptures that I might point to. But when I think of love your neighbor, I, I think I first have to realize, you know, like the men of Issachar in Chronicles, right? You have to understand the times and recognize where we're at. We're in a hyperly a hyper individualistic age um, that, you know, you know, if you follow Mark Sayers, uh, he's a pastor out of Melbourne, Australia, and he talks a lot about the role of place and the role of like grounding um, our spirituality in a actual physical location and how hard that is because we, we oftentimes, um, you know, operate our faith in a non-place mentality. We go to places um, pre-pandemic that are ahistorical, right? We go to coffee shops, um, Starbucks looks the same in Bellevue as it looks the same in the Central District. We, our churches may be newer churches and buildings that are relatively new and kind of look similar and not really grounded in history. Our schools um, are torn down and rebuilt. And so you, you kind of lose a sense of history, a sense of place, and couple that with technology and the hyper individualism of our age, we sometimes struggle to go, well, who is my neighbor? And so I think for me, some of uh, recognizing the times that we're in, the context that we're in, particularly in a very wealthy, well-educated region that we're in, in Seattle metro area, is just first of all going, what is the physical place where I reside? Because Jeremiah 29 verse 7 or 4 through 7 says, you know, hey, you know, where you're at, build, plant trees, take wives, you know, participate, you know, bind yourself to the welfare of your community and of your city. Um, and I think probably some of you are familiar with that passage when I, and when I read the article uh, with you guys were involved in with that corporate repentance last year, that's, that's doing it right. That's saying, look, our welfare is grounded in the welfare of the East side, or it's grounded in the welfare of my local neighborhood. 
you know, you, you think about, um, I believe it's Psalm 121, where it says, uh, for the peace of Jerusalem, I will, I will seek your, your good. And so the idea for me is, gosh, for this, for the sake of, for the sake of my church, for the sake of my spiritual community, I will seek the good of my city. And so how do I really, what does that mean? Like, how do I enter into places physically where I live, my physical neighbor, uh, the um, neighborhood watch group that's on my block. Um, a lot of times in the central district, when I was working, there were all these, there was friction between new residents and old residents. And so it was participating with the neighborhood, um, not, not just block watch, but actually the neighborhood, um, uh, the words are escaping me, but the neighborhood meetings where we'd come together as residents and homeowners and homeowners and business owners and talk about zoning, talk about safety, um, talk about our schools, like all these things, like I have to participate as a citizen. But I think also in terms of who, um, my na- loving my neighbor, it goes back to Luke chapter 10, where the, the lawyer says, who is my neighbor? And Jesus tells this story about this man who was a, met with robbers and he's beat between the Jer- Jerusalem and Jericho and he's left for dead and who shows up, but a Samaritan and the Samaritan sh- becomes neighborly, right? Jesus says at the end of the passage, you know, he doesn't say, well, this is your neighbor. He says, how do you be neighborly? And it's the Samaritan who comes in and regardless of the background of that person shows the love of God and he proves to be neighborly. And so for me, when I think about that passage, I think about, well, how do I be neighborly? It's serving people who may or may not be of the same cultural background. That means I have to come in as a listener. Uh, and also it means on the flip side of that, I, I may be called to, to work with someone who's a Samaritan, someone who I hate or don't like, because the Samaritans weren't people that the Jewish people liked, to be honest. So it means actually working with people that I'm, I, may not see eye to eye with and learning from them and listening. That's so good. Um, I love that. <clears throat> Can you talk a little bit about, um, I think what, uh, one of the previous conversations that we had, uh, you were talking about this idea of presence. Um, and when I think about that story of uh, the Good Samaritan, right, I think so much of like what he embodied in terms of like how he loved was through presence. Um, what does it look like for you? Cause I know that's really important in the work that you do. Uh, and even just the posture that you've taken as a listener, right? Like even that language of being a listener and a learner first connotes really this idea of like being present and kind of showing up for the spaces or the places or the neighborhoods that you occupy. Um, yeah. Wh- wh- I guess, how would you like, what does it look like um, to show up? What does it look like to be present uh, in a community? I-, I know some of those examples you shared, but are there any kind of other ideas or thoughts that, that you have when you think about this idea of, of presence. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. Well, I think maybe the answer needs to be, let's think pre pandemic answer that. And then during pandemic, yeah. <laughs> this is, right? That's, that's super helpful, right? Because yeah. how that looks, looks different in a lot of, yeah. yeah. Well, I think pre pandemic and hopefully praise, you know, let's pray this through post pandemic yeah. <laughs> going to come out of this. Um, I think a lot of it is, I like to think of what is the theology of my neighborhood or what is the liturgy of my neighborhood? Mm. Every, every community has a liturgy, a rhythm to it, Mm. a place where we come in and, you know, the liturgy and the church services, you know, call to worship, you know, confession, Mm -hmm. you know, that speaks to accountability, right. And, and possibility. So like, Oh gosh, confession, like I've sinned, like there's things that need to be repaired and made amending. Right. And, and then, you know, affirmation, right? I'm forgiven. There's grace, right? So where, where do we come together and we, we, we worship? We, what do we do in Bellevue or Redmond where we come together and we celebrate, right? Where, what patterns and traditions are in? Um, and I, I don't know specifically what neighborhood Common Good is in. Maybe some of you are in a collection of neighborhoods. But in my neighborhood, where do we come together for a call to worship? Is it a football game? I mean, is it a is it a, a play? Is it a theater production? Right? Where do we come together and deal with accountability, like confession of sin? Right? Where do we come together and we offer grace? Like, where are the places where, as neighbors, we butt heads because there's a there's a shelter that's moved in or an, a tent encampment, and we need to come together and go. You know what? 
so-and-so who owns a house down the street, I don't like them, you know, or this organization wants to start a halfway house. I've got problems with that, right? There's accountability. There's, there's budding of heads. Where can the church speak into those places of liturgy, of worship, call to worship, uh, accountability, right? And, and where are there places of grace, including the church, but also other places where we say, you know what, let's come together and offer forgiveness. How can we work and build together? Uh, Peter Block in his book, Community, talks about building places of transformation that are build both accountability and possibility. You know, when you preach a sermon, you're preaching the, you know, the grace of God and God's imagination for redemption. That's, that's the, the uh, possibility, but you're also preaching that you and I are sinners and that's, that's the accountability. And it, and I'm not doing a good job as a preacher and pastor Royce isn't doing a good job as a preacher if he doesn't give you both that, yes, you are sinners, but you're also saved by grace, right? Accountability and possibility. Well, extrapolate that out to the community. Where as the church, common good, can we come out and be a part of the liturgy of the neighborhood where we're seeing accountability and possibility? Then I think about liturgy in terms of, you know, confession of faith. What do we believe about this, this community that we're in? Where in Bell, Bellevue or Redmond do, are there secular places where we come together and we affirm God's goodness or the goodness that we see in the community around us. And I think that the church pre and post pandemic should show up to these places, even as a guest and not as a host, but coming in and saying, how can we as common good support something that's happening in the arts? How can we come in as participants in the neighborhood community gatherings where we're hashing through homelessness? Where can we celebrate and support financially? So we're not funneling our budgets just to run things as common good, but where can we funnel dollars and our presence and our volunteer, um, our volunteerism into places where there are nonprofits that are doing great kingdom work that are affirming, right? Confession of faith, what we believe about Bellevue or Redmond or Kirkland. Um, I go on and on, right? But obviously Psalm 121, you know, for the sake of, of, uh, of my, of the house of the Lord, I will bless Jerusalem. Where are there places where I offer a benediction and not a curse over Kirkland or Bellevue or Redmond? Wow. Instead of complaining about the city, complaining about the traffic, which I'm apt to do living in West Seattle, trying to get across the city, and they just shut down the first first avenue bridge again and i want to complain and curse <laughs> s dot um how can i pray a blessing over my city so that was a lot but i'm just trying to say like yeah. think about the liturgy of your community the theology of your neighborhood and enter into it because god is already at work there right oh during a pandemic that's a whole enchilada right that's a whole <laughs> different can of worms and I think some of that is that financially what we're doing, Grace, is we're trying to focus on, okay, where are there safe places where we can do food distribution, partner with nonprofits because there's so many people facing food insecurity. Mm -hmm. Where can we, because, you know, our church doesn't, I'm curious what your church is doing, Royce, but we don't actually own our building. We still pay rent, but it's kind of drastically reduced to our, our landlord. We're in a Seventh-day Adventist church. So we're able to bank a lot of our fun, funds and redistribute those funds to businesses of color, to black, indigenous, people of color, BIPOC ran businesses, small business, small loan businesses. Like we're not giving money to huge nonprofits. We're get, we're finding businesses. We're paying attention to, I pay attention to a lot of neighborhood blogs where I'm finding that soup kitchens, uh, bit, uh, small cafes um, that are running their their businesses, but also are redistributing canned goods to their communities. And so we just donate money to those places or we buy food from black owned business or businesses or immigrant owned businesses, or, you know, when chop and Chaz happened, you know, Chinatown international district was ransacked that whole community and, and Chinatown has been really beat up. So we're funneling money to their neighborhood, uh, um, business community and partnering, having conversations with them. Hey, can we drop $3,000 in your neighborhood? Uh, I think it, it was called interim with Bob Santos, but it's a uh, shoot. It's, it's the Chinatown international district business association, like 
funneling money to those organizations that are helping the poor, the elderly. Um, so there's ways during the pandemic where we can shift resources. We can partner with organizations. We're doing a, a hotspot right now, which is a partnership with a local elementary school and other churches and providing remote learning for kids affected by the pandemic um, who need a safe, warm place to, to do their remote learning and have a warm meal from you know, 8 a.m. to 4 p.m. So we're trying creative ways to set up structures for belonging and empowerment, even though we can't physically be there. Right, right, that's so good. That was a lot. I've, I've, I need a sip of water and I hope maybe some of you need a sip of something. I'm taking well. some good notes. I hope, I hope everyone's taking some good notes. And by the way, if you have specific as Pastor Jason is sharing some things, if there's kind of specific questions, uh, feel free to kind of just pop them in the chat. And, you know, we could obviously we can make this a, a, a interactive space. So if there's ideas, questions as Pastor Jason, Jason is sharing, uh, feel free to drop those in there and, and we can uh, include that in this conversation. But so much good stuff just right there. Uh, Pastor Jason, it, it, uh, are a lot of those kind of initiatives that you're doing, like even in this pandemic, are those things that kind of you are driving or like, have you been able to, has this been really an opportunity for kind of individuals in your church who kind of live and occupy different spaces within the neighborhoods and communities to like kind of initiate those things and say, hey, Pastor Jason, like here's an organization or here's, you know, a business that like, or it kind of hasn't been a combination of, or like, I'm just curious, like how is a lot of these kind of ideas and these creative ways that you're engaging, like how they come about? Yeah. Well, we're in process with that. In fact, we just had a meeting last week where myself and my um, par uh, partner, um, our, our initiative is called Serve the City. Um, and uh, up until this point, it's been, well, pastor, it's been the Pastor Jason and brother Jeremy show <laughs> because, gotcha. because I'm so connected in various different communities. I hear of things and my congregation, you know, shifted my role from being internal to back into an external role. So I'm able to partner with pastors across the city or business owners or community leaders and say, Hey, I, I, I know the work you're doing. How can our church participate? There are some small opportunities left um, here and there where members of the congregation have come and said, hey, I hear what's happening here. I think we should partner. But for the most part, it has been, you know, leveraging my my past experience. And so that's a problem, right? Like if I get hit by a truck, I said to the group last week, if, if, if Jason gets hit by a truck and he's gone and, and Jeremy is gone, we know, you know, um, that, what do we do with this ministry? Like it shouldn't be ran off of one person. It shouldn't be common good. Shouldn't run everything outreach through pastor Royce and his staff. It has to be something that's shared by the collective. And what we've been wrestling with at grace is that most of us are again, going back to Mark Sayers, we are so prone to our own individualistic lives. Mm -hmm. And then it's compounded in the pandemic where we're stuck in our homes we work for Amazon, Microsoft, Google, or we're educators and we're doing remote learning or, you know, like we're highly socioeconomically, we're, we're stable, but we're stuck in our homes. And even before pandemic, I see the work of the work as done by the few uh, people that I give my tithes and offerings to, but I myself am not really a participant in it. And I want to be, I admire it, but I'm too busy raising my kids or I'm too busy because my bosses during this pandemic are upping the hours I'm supposed to be working. You know, They're not pulling back and saying, hey, we know you're depressed <laughs> because you're stuck in your house. We know you're fighting with your wife and your kids because you're on Zoom calls and keep getting interrupted. Or in my case, this puppy keeps barking and I didn't want the puppy in the first place. And now I got this puppy in my house. So I'm kind of venting right now. But the idea is like, it's hard. Yeah. to pierce that bubble of hyper individualism. I was already captive to my own echo chamber and now it's com compounded during this pandemic. So how do we do that? And so at Grace, you know, again, I'm coming to you guys as a learner, not a guru. We've been working through that and setting up a committee where on a monthly basis, um, 
we're bringing in not just the people I work with in, um, in the in the leadership level, but bringing in lay people for a monthly meeting where we're updating you on the budget. What have we been doing with this money you've been giving to? And just being frank with you, hey, I went over to this cafe and I dropped seven hundred and fifty dollars to this cafe because they're they're doing great work. Or we gave money to this feed the people initiative and they're cooking hot meals. And I want you to know that we're not using this money to go to Cancun or whatever, you know. Um, and then I want you to help run this thing. Like some of you are going to work with facilitating where volunteers are going. Some of you are going to work with setting up a fund to empower community groups to use that money to incubate businesses. So if some of you live in Green Lake, pick a block in Green Lake where there's mom and pop restaurants and organizations and use this two, $3,000 to buy gift cards from these restaurants or give money to the food bank on that block, right? I need you, I need you right? Um, this is not a Pastor Jason show. And I think what's informative for me I got all these books here, but you know, this book called Eat What Is Set Before You by Scott Hagley. I was in a doctoral program at Seattle University and was reading this book, A Missiology of the Congregation in Context. And he talks about a uh, church that, you know, remains anonymous, but was in the Midwest and they had two gifted leaders. And those gifted leaders did everything. Oh, they loved Jack and Jill. They did such a great job. It was this married couple. But when Jack and Jill would initiate a few people from the congregation to open up a garden in the neighborhood and they wanted to work with the community, every, every time they do a community garden initiative, it would be people from the church and not from the neighborhood. Mm -hmm. And what was the problem? And it was, well, instead of Jack and Jill doing the work, how does the collective of the congregation participate with food justice initiatives already happening in the neighborhood? And so gradually shifting from performative work from a few to collective work. Wow. So with our monthly meetings with Serve of the City, my hope is that we do two things. We come together and I'm offloading the responsibility saying, many of you live in Lake City or you live in Redmond. What's happening in Redmond? Yeah. Uh, what's happening in Lake City? How can we move finances and leadership to, to each of you in your neighborhoods to empower them? And that's going to require that you re re uh, re you know pursue again people in your community group who've withdrawn during the pandemic because you're too busy or you hate doing Zoom community group, which I understand. But then secondly, let's also have praxis. So not just practice, but praxis, where we get together on a monthly basis with lay leaders in the community and say, "Here's practice. Here's what we're doing." Um, uh, and then how do we um, think about reflection? you know, reflect upon what we're doing. What was that like for you? How did you feel doing the food distribution program? What scriptures speak into a conversation? And then, so practice, reflection, and teaching. How do we find in, um, inspiration and guidance from the scriptures? So praxis is that three-pronged thing that we do on a monthly basis where we reflect we think about the practice that we're doing and we look to the scriptures for guidance and we do that cycle every month. So gosh, I'm talking a lot, but that's kind of an answer to your question. Yeah. Yeah. That's so good. That's so good. And what I, uh, what I love, what I'm hearing you kind of share is you're kind of creating ownership, right. From those within your community. And I guess this, this is a little bit of a question that, that I would love for you to kind of speak to. Um, like when I think about a church wanting to be present and to show up and engage in a community and neighborhood, um, and it sounds like this might be the case for, for your congregation, uh, you know, we've got, even though we're kind of centralized and based, like headquartered, so to speak, and that we have worship gatherings like in Bellevue, mm -hmm. uh, the reality is, right, that we have individuals, uh, our congregation is made up of folks that uh, are all over uh, the region. And so, um, yeah, I guess when, when you think about kind of engaging our neighborhood as a church and as a community, um, how, how would you, what would kind of be your thoughts around that? Like, do you really see, given that you guys are in Capitol Hill, do you kind of see that as your primary community or do you really feel like your neighborhoods are just reflective of the neighborhoods that your congregants kind of live into? And then it's really kind of this scattering of the church, so to speak, rather than this idea of like, we are just present here within kind of a specific neighborhood or geographical location that our church gathers in for like Sunday worship, so to speak. Yeah. 
yeah, we're, we're wrestling with that. And I think, are, do you own your building at Common Good? Or? Oh, so we're, we're similar to, to you all where we okay. rent space on a yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah, you know, not really owning a building does present itself with obstacles, but also opportunities. And I think similar to what I would infer from what I'm hearing about Common Good is, yeah, we're all stratified. You know, when we, when the church was planted 22 years ago, it was all young, you know, um, 20 somethings who most of them didn't have kids and everyone was in Capitol Hill. And so it was easy to say, this is a church for Capitol Hill by Capitol Hill to Capitol Hill. And so what we've ran into uh, since I left Union Gospel Mission, and I've been now at Grace for three and a half years, is that, yeah, I mean, we're almost a community commuter church. There's everyone. There's people who live on the east side. There's people who live in Shoreline, some in Edmonds, some down in Renton. Um, And there's still, I think, predominantly, we're still centered in Capitol Hill, Central District, South Lake Union. Lots of people who work in tech. Um, So I think what we've tried to do, we've sometimes leaned too much in the decentralized way of going about things where, hey, you, you know, you do you like, hey, do you up in Lake City, do you up in Shoreline? Um, and I think we need to continue to, to lean into that. Um, the pandemic has really broken our community group, group ministry because people just aren't meeting in person and they don't have energy to meet over Zoom. And, I, you know, I don't know how you all I would love to know how you all are experiencing your community groups. Um, but I, I've the leadership and I have also been trying to go. Let's also recover a centralized approach as well. Mm-hmm. So when Chop and Chaz happened, our offices are down the street from from. Chaz or Chop, whatever that was. Um, and so I, I just felt like, man, we, we, we have to recover a sense of place here. This is three blocks down the, the road. Let's be present. Let's, let's help out. Let's give um, um, support to those who are homeless. Let's rebuild businesses that are broken. And I think, honestly, we have to continue to hold those intentions. The, the centralized approach where, hey, we're, we're in Bellevue we need to still be about Bellevue mm-hmm. because too much, too much of our proclivities are to just be in our homes and, and be in our enclaves and not think about place. And yeah. it's just so imperative that we pair participate with the community in a real practical way. Right. I can't emphasize that enough, but we also have to realize that, yeah, we we're all stratified and how do I see the kingdom uh, flow through me and around me at my soccer, uh, you know, my soccer practice up in Kirkland or Redmond or whatever. I hear, I hear on the East side, soccer is huge. You know, I, you know, that's just what I'm told. So I think like, man, uh, how can I bless my soccer league for my kid or whatever, whatever you guys do on the East side, I think it's not too different from Seattle. So, yeah, I know that's kind of like, those are big concepts. And I, again, I'm, we're in process. So forgive me if I don't have like, something practical other than we're just kind of wrestling through the same things as I think you guys are. Yeah, no, that's super helpful. Right. Because I think just even knowing, right. That communities, different communities are asking similar questions. Cause I think that's certainly something that we wrestle with. Right. But I love that reminder of like, it's not a, it's not a, a a one or the other, right. It's not necessarily a binary thing, but there's a both and uh, that we can empower people to be decentralized in the community and to show up for the communities that they're a part of. Uh, But at the same time, collectively as a community to to be present in a specific space yeah and what i think you know talking with other pastors in the uh, downtown area that i think is similar to bellevue i mean people are flocking to bellevue to do their job they're working in these offices there's a lot of money in those areas and i think a lot of pastors myself included have talked about how do we reach that community because it's so corporate and sanitize. I mean, what's going on there, but I think coming out of the pandemic, there, there, there are ways that we've, you know, we've talked about reaching kind of like Tim Keller did 20, 20, 30 years ago, but like tailoring some of our work to participate in the business community, Mm -hmm. the revitalization of these downtown corridor businesses areas, places where you can set up Bible studies, you know, during lunches or participating with events that are happening in those areas. So it's hard. Yeah. Yeah. What would you say to somebody that is, um, you know, when they think about like their physical kind of geographical kind of locale, right? 
maybe the, the neighborhood in which they live or the neighborhood in which their office is, although that's for a lot of people, their homes now. Um, but when, you know, people think about, um, cause I, you know, I, I think I've struggled with this even personally, right. Um, or even as a church where, um, you know, if the spaces that you kind of occupy, uh, are, are perhaps very well resourced, right? Like when we, like when I think about the neighborhood, like I live on Mercer Island, for example, right? Um, you know, as a whole, right? Mercer Island, like it's kind of like in terms of needs, when people think about like neighborhoods or areas there that there is significant need, like most people don't think about Mercer Island, right? What would you say as an encouragement to somebody that maybe finds himself um, in a neighborhood or an area where, when they just look around, they, there doesn't seem to be significant need. Um, so when it comes to this idea of like loving, loving our neighbor, right? Like, I think on, on one hand, it means like your literal neighbor. Um, but then oftentimes, um, is it possible that your neighbor could actually be a neighbor across the lake or on the other side in a different county? Like, what would you say? Um, cause I know you've kind of shared, uh, just even about the individuals within your church, right? That maybe have experienced kind of similar dynamics. Uh, yeah, what would be some of your encouragement to that where folks that are maybe living in neighborhoods where they don't feel like there's a lot of need and they're saying, I want to love my neighbor, but I, I don't know how, I don't know what that looks like. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, you know, a, a couple things. I, one is, yes, I think some of us live in communities that are well-resourced, you know, and I, when I think about Mercer Island or other places that are relatively doing really well, um, I think we do have a responsibility um, to open our eyes and ears to pay attention to other parts of our city and our region that really do need help. Um, and not coming from a, you know, white savior or classist savior perspective, but just to say, man, the difference between public schools on the east side and north Seattle compared to south Seattle is really clear. Um, so, you know, you guys might see, if you look closely in my office here, I've got comic books cause I'm a comic book nerd. So, you know, I've got, I've got Spider-Man here, and, you know, and Spider-Man says, you know, with great power comes great responsibility. All right. I had to work in some comic books cause I'm, I'm just such a nerd. And that was just for my own enjoyment, not for yours. So I'm sorry if you don't care for comic books, but you know, there is, there is an element of like responsibility. I didn't do it, right? I didn't, I didn't make schools or communities dilapidated myself, but as a participant, as a, as a civil, uh, uh, as a citizen of my city and my region, I do have a responsibility um, to bless people who are not in my community who need help. Again, not coming from a savior complex, but again, coming in and saying, where do I find uh, places that the Lord is calling me prayerfully to go, I can change, I can help participate financially or with my time and energy to support these communities that, that need, you know, resources. But the yeah. second thing I'd say is, you know, we have to come in as, as guests and as exiles. Um, too much in our, in our upwardly mobile church context, do we view ourselves as on the home team or on our home turf? And we fail to rem remember that when I quote Jeremiah 29, or when we read the scriptures, what does Peter call us? First, Peter calls us exiles. Mm -hmm. And I think we need to repent of our sense of that, that we're, we're comfortable because our bills are paid or, you know, we've got all these streaming services. We've got nice cars. We've got, we're well-educated that Mercer Island isn't a place of need. Uh, no, I think that we come in as exiles. We're not, we're not, uh, we're not people who are at home. Like our home is coming in the new age. And because I am an exile, I can go out of my pain as an exile. I can join with people who also feel exiled and marginalized. That could be people like me who are well-resourced, but are depressed, um, are anxious because we have to keep, keep our bank accounts a certain way, or we got to get our kids performing at a certain educational per, uh, performance level. So what does that mean? That means going to our well-resourced schools and going, man, maybe there's places for us to do mindfulness classes. I know I'm, I'm just, I'm just, I'm thinking as I'm talking, my wife does a lot of work in mindfulness through uh, UW and, and, uh, 
Seattle Children's Hospital. But, you know, there are ways that people are just freaking depressed who earn a lot of money and who are built uh, on, uh, who have built their lives around the American dream, who have come here from other countries and are running themselves ragged to keeping up with the Joneses. They're, they're white, they're, they come from Asian, Asian backgrounds, African backgrounds who are immigrants and are just trying to be on the grind. And they live in Laurelhurst or Bellevue. And the church needs to speak critically to those contexts and not say, well, we got this because we're doing well. Let's go help out other places that are less fortunate. No, you're just as bankrupt. So I always quote the activists uh, from, uh, man, somewhere uh, in the 60s, Lila Watson, she was an African activist. And she says, if you come here to help me, then you're wasting your time. But if you come to me because your liberation is bound up with mine, then let's work together. So I come as an exile and yeah, I resource and help resource struggling parts of my city. But I also go, what does it mean on Capitol Hill, yeah. Laurelhurst, Redmond to say, there are places where we are just as broken and out of my brokenness, I come in and participate with the brokenness of my community, even if we make six figures. Wow, that's so good. I love that. Um, question from um, our audience. And I think it just got sent to me. Let, let me uh, let me read this question. Um, this is actually from, from Linda. Uh, Linda, thanks for sharing this question. Uh, she said the city of Bellevue uh, wants to create a cross cultural facility, uh, but is struggling to understand what that would look like. Uh, is it a facility or is it a program? Uh, how can they encourage cross culture activities rather than one specific activity? Hmm. So, so they want to set up a cross-cultural facility, but not necessarily programs out of it. Is that? Uh, I think they're they're struggling to know should it just be a facility or is it a program? A okay, combination of both. Sure. Um, well, yeah, yeah I, I could. I guess I could see the distinction. Like maybe it's it's meant to be a a safe place that could be used for different interests that are multi-ethnic or multicultural versus actually driving it with programming, if, if I'm understanding it correctly. Well, m- number one, I would wonder who, who's behind it. Um, uh, is, is, are there are stakeholders from multiple communities that are helping to create that space. If that's the case, I would feel good about it. Like regardless of whether they're drive, if, if it's multiple stakeholders of different perspectives and backgrounds, then I would feel good about like, yeah, let's just open up a space where people can, you know, pay a fee to use it for whatever event feels good to them. Or as long as it's not, you know, denigrating other cultures and people groups. Um, so I think whether it's driving with uh, programming or hosting and creating a space of hospitality, I think as long as it's ran by people of multiple different stakeholders and they, they're building together, I would feel good about that. If it's one group saying, well, let's make a multicultural space, whether that's a white uh, agenda or maybe it's you know one particular culture group. I would feel more nervous about that because you're not really working with leaders to create something that you're building together. So without knowing specifically, Linda, what you're talking about, that's just my my gut is that I've seen where people want to open up space and they're doing it from a monocultural perspective of homogeneity mm-hmm. instead of going, well, how do, how do we heterogeneously reach out to stakeholders and open up space? Uh, it's not, it's not what is done. It's just how is it done and who is it done with um, that I, that I would be thinking. Yeah. This is being driven by city council and, you know, Bellevue is actually almost 50% minority groups, but what they're noticing is nobody's, so there's a lot of activities going on, but it's all very separate groups. So they want to have a, whether it's a facility or program to encourage people to create this cross-cultural. So it's not, yeah. So I think it's a, is it a facility? I'm helping, I'm helping with the, um, I'm on the consulting team that is helping them kind of navigate this. So yeah, I just thought it was interesting that you mentioned all the, that, that is it something that should be run by a nonprofit? Mm. Is it run by an organization? In my experience working with Seattle and thank you, Linda, you know, I, sometimes the city has, it's been good to have the city lead those things 
because when nonprofits, nonprofits are often competing for dollars and people start questioning, oh, well, what's that group doing? And oh, I, them again, oh, they always are, are getting the contracts, so on and so forth. I wonder, uh, Bellevue, what, how well they're received by stakeholders in this city. Like, is that a neutral group that is getting a lot of support from the community? Or do you feel like Bellevue is, doesn't have a lot of trust from, from stakeholders? Oh, I think they're just in the beginning stages. So that's the goal now is how do you build that stakeholder group? Yeah. Who do you include? I mean, it sounds like you should include everybody Everybody who has a stake in. Yeah. It's so it's so hard. Hey, everybody nowadays is drinking Haterade. So, uh, you know, people don't like the city or they don't like particular groups. I think it really is like when the city can come alongside and build personal relationships, what I have seen in Seattle that's been helpful is that when the Office of Arts and Culture comes together to build an arts and cultural district for Capitol Hill or the Central District, they go to a wide variety of stakeholders and they say, say, hey, we need you. Let's have an introductory meeting. Like, how can we set up a cultural arts district for the Central District? And they come and pick and, you know, pick people of wide variety of backgrounds, not a huge group, you know, six or seven people. And then they ask those six and seven people, hey, who's missing in this room? And that's kind of how it grows, but it's really hard. So uh, I hope it, I, I'm hoping for the best in Bellevue. Thanks. Thanks, Pastor Jason. That's really good. And I think even just that posture of like what you're even recommending, right, for for the city of Bellevue to kind of move forward and wanting to create this space. I think so much of that is just reflective of the things that you've been sharing about what it looks like for the church, right, to kind of take this posture of, of engaging our communities and understanding who are the stakeholders and understanding that we are very much just a part of these communities that we're trying to serve. Um, and uh, I think it's just a different kind of mindset and perspective, right? Even as we think about this idea of loving our neighbor uh, and the posture of humility as we kind of enter into those spaces. And as you said, right, acknowledging our own brokenness and our own need and desperation in the midst of it. Uh, and that this is, this is about mutual kind of dependency, right? That this is, that we need each other. So wherever we find ourselves on the spectrum of, uh, the various hierarchies right within our, our, our society. So, uh, yeah. Um, Pastor Jason, I want to be respectful uh, of your time and of our time. I know we're, we're kind of running short on time. I did want to talk a little bit. Maybe we can kind of just end uh, perhaps our conversation kind of around some of this. Um, you know, when I think about this whole notion uh, of loving our neighbor, I can't help but think about the idea of, of neighborhood. And, and you kind of touched on this, right? Uh, in kind of a lot of different ways. I've actually heard um, Terrence Lester, he, he's the founder of Love Beyond Walls. Um, he said this recently, he said, you can't claim to love your neighbor if you neglect the neighborhood that shaped them. Mm. When Jesus said, love your neighbor, he meant the neighborhood and the problems it faces too. And mm -hmm. um, so, so powerful, but I think you were kind of speaking to to some of that, right? And the truth is, you, you're talking about even just some of the inequities and disparities between neighborhoods and whether we are our church in, in Bellevue, right? We live whatever neighborhood. The fact is that not all neighborhoods are the same, right? That uh, different neighborhoods have, have different access to different resources, right? And we know that there are a number of disparities and inequities amongst different neighborhoods in terms of access to education, right? Housing, uh, wealth, social, social services, healthcare, whatever jobs, whatever that might be. Um, and, and the truth is, I think sometimes we forget or we just fail to realize that these things didn't happen by accident, right? Um, that these inequities and disparities that we see within neighborhoods and communities and across neighborhoods and communities, they, they were created in a lot of ways. And it goes back to what you were talking about. Like, we need to understand like our history, right? Of the spaces that we occupy and the places that we occupy. Uh, and I think that's such a great reminder, even for us, right? As we find ourselves as a church in Bellevue, what does it look like? Cause I don't think we've necessarily done a great job at that of like understanding the history of right. The, the spaces that we occupy. Um, but you, you had talked about, um, you know, I know you had spent a lot of time um, church planting right in the central district uh, running a cafe in the central district and a lot of dif different challenges, right. That came from that uh, given uh, just the, the different dynamics that are at play. 
mm-hmm. uh, specifically. So I was wondering, maybe if you could just kind of share a little bit more about um, kind of like, I, I guess maybe some of the backstory around even the central district, because I think that's even just helpful. Uh, mm-hmm you know, the ways in which things like redlining played into like the CDB kind of being a place historically that was black, but then the trends that we're seeing now with gentrification and a lot of the challenges that you were seeing um, in the community that you're a part of. So yeah. Uh, maybe just talk, a li- maybe unpack some of those kind of things for us uh, because maybe that's kind of new for, for a lot of us. Uh, what are some of these kind of systemic kind of realities, right? That shape our neighbor neighborhoods um, and then why is it important for us as Christians that, especially those of us who, you know, care about things like racial justice and reconciliation, like, why is that important to, to understand uh, our, our neighborhoods or the neighborhoods that we are a part of and also trying to, to serve and to love? Yeah. Yeah. You know, I, I would, um, you know, before I kind of retell a little bit of the history, I would say it's important to really think about our mentality of how we think about place and history, again, we do live in a, 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 a time where we, we operate almost ahistorically, like we just kind of show up and this place doesn't exist until I'm there um, and not really paying attention to that. And I think, you know, books like um, David Leong's Race and Place, he's a professor at SPU, is uh, really formative and helpful. Also, Willie James Jennings uh, work uh, unpacking um, colonialism and the church in the book called the Christian imagination. These help bring about, um, help, help, help us as Christians think about critically about how we enter into spaces and how our churches enter into places. And we come in almost recapitulating colonialism and imperialism. We show up and this place doesn't exist. And it's, a, uh, and we show up to these places and God isn't there until our church shows up or until our franchise of church shows up or until I come, God isn't there or these places don't have a place of history and value. Um, and so we, you know, even in church planting, I would come in and just feel like, whoa, like um, I come into the neighborhood and I'm seeing that I'm coming in with my franchise of church and not paying attention to the fact that there's churches that have been here for decades that have been laboring hard to protect and advocate for the poor and for the marginalized. So we unintentionally just recapitulate colonialism um, and, and disparities within public schools where you have our schools have higher tracks of education with AP, uh, IB, honors classes, predominantly white and upper middle class And then we have the general ed where you have people from African, indigenous, Latino, Southeast Asian perspectives that are not doing as well. And it's because you have these neighborhoods that have been broken by racism and a history of discrimination. So Willie James Jennings, David Leong, these are books and authors that you should look up that help you think about what happens when we don't come in as exiles or when we, as Jennings calls it, fail to have a Gentile remembrance, where we are fellow Gentiles grafted into the people of God, and we should be coming to spaces that that uh, we come as guests rather than hosts. We come in uh, as learners of the history of the neighborhood. So what you see in Seattle and every major uh, city in this uh, in our country is that it's built upon uh, racism and classism. I five in Seattle's built uh, along neighborhoods that were places where immigrants would come, African-American folks and indigenous cultures were built and were huddled around these neighborhoods. And I-5 is built among places where there's lots of environmental pollution. There's lots of just uh, trash and garbage and noise in these poorer neighborhoods intentionally. And what would happen is that communities like the Central District and other South Seattle communities You would have those areas where near freeways where people were were huddled in by the race and by class. So central district by restrictive covenants, if you moved into these neighborhoods in the early 20th century um, or in the second uh, great migration during World War Two, if I'm black, the only neighborhood I could live in was in the central district because Green Lake, Lake City, other parts of downtown, Belltown, they had they had deeds in their um, communities that said if you are black, Middle Eastern, certain parts of Asia, 
uh, certain parts of um, uh, Latin America, you couldn't live in these neighborhoods. So if you're black, the only neighborhood I could live in was in the central district. So that's why the CD was a place historically black and Jewish and a few other um, uh, Japanese communities uh, would be huddled and couldn't live in those in any other neighborhood but the central district, but Chinatown. And then what happened is, is you had a lot of white flight out to Mercer Island, Bellevue, North Seattle, Green Lake, because white people didn't want their kids going to school or didn't want their sons and daughters fellowshipping with these poor black uh, or Japanese or Mexican or, um, you know, other groups. So um, I'm sorry I'm talking in generalizations and I'm talking really fast, but what you had is a culture of restrictive covenants in Seattle. You can still see these in our deeds in neighborhoods across the city. But then there's a phenomenon of redlining that would keep home ownership low that would drive down property values within the central district and developers would come in in the early 20th, I mean, 21st century and buy up these places. So I would be as a business owner talking with developers, very rich people from South Lake Union. And they would be like, you know what? It's sexy to live in, in downtown area. Again, people from the suburbs are moving back to the inner city and we want this property. We're going to take the central district and we're going to do what people did 500 years ago. And we're going to rename it New Leshy or Capitol Hill South. And they would buy these developers from the East side or South Lake Union or from China would come and buy up parts of the CD and push African-Americans out who didn't own their property because of redlining, because, because um, banks wouldn't give loans or equitable loans to black owned uh, black people or people of color in the CD and South end. So we didn't own the land. So the only place we could live in were as renters, and poor housing developments in the central district. And then, oh, it's 2005 or it's, it's 2015. Let's buy up these lands and push these people out. So I, forgive me that I'm talking so fast and oh. with large generalizations, but I've been in so many community meetings with heavy hitters in our city and region and investors where people have said, Let's, we're going to rebrand this neighborhood and kick these people out. Um, and you see it happening in Chinatown. And what you see in International District is that because of Bob Santos and other people in that community, they had a little bit more corporate um, solidarity. And so they were able to build nonprofits to resist gentrification happening when the kingdom was shut down and they, they rebuilt the Safeco field. But even that in Chinatown, there's been, you know, there's been some gentrification that's ramped up in Chinatown. Contrast that with the black community. Sometimes there hasn't been as much unity, um, even though there, there's a lot of resilience in that community. It just didn't have the same back backing until recently. Um, and so we've lost in the black community some of our property, some of our unity, because white people were able to come in and buy up this property and push us out. So the CD is no longer the CD anymore. So, gosh, I'm talking a lot and fast and the huge generalizations, but that's kind of the history that we participate in. And because we don't have a Gentile remembrance, we don't come in as learners, we participate in, as church people and just go, oh, this place didn't exist until I show up. And then all of a sudden there's shootings in my neighborhood. And so people come into my cafe and go, oh my gosh, there's so much shootings. Why are there so many shootings in our neighborhood? Or, oh my gosh, I didn't know that there was all this inequity. Well, you and I, we participate in capitalism, what we can buy and afford and don't think about what it's like to just come into a neighborhood and think about its history and story. So bleh, that was an answer to your question. Dr. Jason, man, that is so, that's so important. Thank you so much for, for sharing that. What would you say maybe as, as a way to kind of close, close our time? Cause there's so much there to unpack. And um, again, appreciate your encouragement and challenge for us to to go and learn and to read these books and to better understand the history and and, and the complexities and uh, certainly the injustices that are oftentimes rooted in the spaces that we occupy and, and to certainly be acknowledge the ways in which we oftentimes inadvertently uh, perpetuate right those those same systems um, outside of kind of just that learning and that posture of like 
um, being more cognizant, right. Uh, and mindful of like, what are the ways that we continue to kind of perpetuate these things? Are there other things that you would say, like the church needs to be doing, um, to kind of acknowledge and to address, um, and to speak into kind of some of these things that, that you're sharing and maybe we can kind of just end there. Any kind of, yeah, any kind of specific things that you would say, I, I wish the church was, was doing a better job of, of this or doing more of this because yeah. these things could really be helpful. Yeah, I think I've given, given a lot of categories already for corporate life, but I would just say, brothers and sisters, I think we need to take a deep breath. You know, it's the pan, we're on pandemic, happens every hundred years, I guess, I don't know. But I think we need to sit back, take a breath and go, there are some large things that we can do as common good that we can help out with. But the Lord has put me in my family or on my street corner. Um, he's put me in this place for a reason. And what is it, Lord, prayerfully in this time of wilderness, in this time of pandemic? You know, it's Lent. We think about being out in the wilderness right now. Lord, Holy Spirit, guide me. How, what can I do even in my relationships um, to open my eyes and ears? How can, by, how can I be a learner? How can I be vulnerable and open um, in my close, proximate uh, neighborhood or in my own family um, to cultivate, you know, anti-racism, you know, in my, when I'm talking to my family members and we're talking about oh man, those Koreans, or oh man, those black people, or oh man, those white people, right? How can we actually go, no, uncle so-and-so, can we not say that <laughs> you know, about that group of people? Or, you know, uh, how can I in my school or at my job be a place where I'm learning and listening and not participating in capitalism just willy-nilly will, willy and not thinking about, oh man, maybe, maybe my Christianity and my capitalism should kind of be intention with one another instead of overlapping completely. Maybe my political persuasion as a Republican or a Democrat or, or a, you know, a nun person, I don't know, a moderate person, maybe, maybe I need to hold that intention with my Christianity and be formed by the gospel first, and then let's deal with our politics. So I, I feel like I'm talking in categories and not practicalities, but I, I just think that we need to take a deep breath realize that the pandemic actually allows us the opportunity to rethink some things and to think on an individual level, on a meso level, and then on a macro level, what it means to be not just for my neighborhood, but with my neighborhood. Mm -hmm. And how can, and what questions am I being brought with and pressed upon? What questions are in my life? Like, how can I still be a married person when that married person gets on my last nerve and we're stuck in this house together? What does it mean to love my neighbor when my neighbor is my wife or my husband? And how can I walk in humility with my wife, my kids, my neighbor, my school, so on and so forth? Yeah. Yeah. Wow. That's so good. Even just that last part, Pastor Jason, what you just said about like asking questions, because I think so often, even when we think about this notion of loving our neighbor, it's like we want to come in with the answers to fix things versus to really be not just for, but with is this posture again, going back to what you said about learning, right? Is, is the ability to ask good questions. And it's an incarnation, right? Yeah. Jesus didn't come in like the Lone Ranger. And I used to love the Lone Ranger, man. He come in with Tonto, his homeboy. Dude didn't even get his clothes dirty and save the day. But what did Jesus do? Jesus came in like Clint Eastwood in a spaghetti Western movie. He got beat up. He got kicked in the gonads. And can I say that in church? I'm sorry. But, you know, he, he, he didn't save the day without yeah. blood, sweat, and tears. Jesus came in and shed his blood. It's going to take love for us to come out of this pandemic and sacrifice. Yeah. Uh, really give our blood, sweat, and tears. So, and be vulnerable. That's so good. And so often, and I'm guilty of this as well, right? Especially... Those of us that want, when we think about this notion and those of us in the church about loving our neighbor, it's like, we want to, we almost like to do it in a way that is kind of, we could put it in a little box. It's kind of neat and tidy. And it's like, we want to check it off our, our Christian to do list, right? Like, I know I need to love my neighbor because that's what I'm supposed to do. But like, we want to like put parameters around how to do that. But what you just talked about is to, if we're going to do it well and to love our neighbor like Jesus did. It's dirty and it's messy and it's sacrificial and it's uncomfortable and we don't always get it right. And we don't always see perhaps the end result that we want to see, but that's, that, that's what it means to, to really be on the journey. 
So amen. Such good reminders, Pastor Jason. I, I wish we could do this all day. So much to, to learn from you. And um, I just appreciate just your honesty and, and just sharing your journey and your story. And I hope that this is uh, not the last, but the first of many conversations um, that we can have. And, and, and hopefully there'll be ways and opportunities for us, even as a community, to come alongside and to, to partner with what you all are doing on the other side of the lake. I know it's, 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 it's what, like five minutes across the lake, but it feels oftentimes it's spoken of, right? As like worlds apart. Totally. Uh, totally. Uh, yeah. It's crazy. So. Well, I'm blessed by, by you, Pastor Royce and this group and Simon. And uh, I'm, I'm, I'm honored that you guys came today. And I hope, I hope it wasn't infotainment because we do a lot of infotainment, but actually let's know how do we ground this and not just like, Oh, that was interesting and move on. But like, how can we move forward? So, yeah. And we'll definitely be exchanging notes. And uh, as we're kind of figuring out over here on the East side, uh, you know, we'll definitely keep the conversations going. So uh, hey, Pastor Jason, can I close this out in prayer? Yeah. All right. Okay. Let me do that. Uh, God, thank you so much uh, for this space. And I know it's a virtual space, but God, we thank you that you occupy physical spaces and virtual spaces and that you could turn any ground into holy ground. And so, God, we believe right now that this moment was a holy moment, that your spirit was present with us, around us, in us. God, we thank you for what you were doing in Pastor Jason. We thank you for his story and his journey, for every aspect and element of it. God, that nothing is wasted. God, that through every single uh, season of his life, uh, in whatever capacity it is that he served in, um, Lord, we thank you that, um, that you have been forming him, that you have been transforming him and that you have been using him to transform the spaces and places that he occupies. And so I uh, got, we just pray for just your blessing and your favor over him right now. God in his ministry with Grace Church Seattle, thank you for the good work that he is doing there. Lord, we pray uh, that you would continue God to do a good work in and through him, uh, and their community, uh, as they are learning, uh, and growing in ways, uh, to love. Uh, to love their neighbor as well. And so, God, um, we are encouraged uh, knowing, God, that uh, as Common Good Church, we are part of something so much bigger than just ourselves. We are part of the greater church, and we are part of the common grace uh, that is happening in our cities if we would just have the eyes to see the humility and the posture to listen and to learn. Uh, and so, God, uh, all the things that were spoken today, um, God, I pray that you would use them to plant seeds uh, in our hearts. Um, things that were spoken that perhaps have ignited certain ideas, creativity, passions. Uh, God, I pray that you would not let those uh, go to the wayside. God, that I pray that what, whatever happened today, um, God, that you would uh, allow us to build on those things um, so that we wouldn't just be listeners of the word, but that we would be doers of it uh, and that we would be transformed and changed in the process because we all need you and your love and your goodness and your grace uh, and your redemption in our lives. So thank you for that reminder today. Um, so God, we give you this time and uh, we thank you for every person who took time out of their, their Sunday to be here. Um, Lord, I pray that you would use it uh, to advance your purposes, uh, to advance your kingdom, and ultimately for your glory. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.